Good evening, everyone. It is fantastic to be here and to feel the energy and the passion of all of the speakers who come before me and to see so many out of you there in the audience paying attention. I'm Andreas Birnik, and I'm the co-founder of a social enterprise called Carbon Story. And what we're doing, we're essentially using gamification and we're using storytelling to encourage people to sponsor projects around the world that mitigate climate change. And you can do that essentially by, by buying carbon credits. And I have four of my fantastic team members over there in the audience, so you're very welcome to grab us afterwards. So we're here to talk about gamification. And gamification may be a new thing for quite a lot of you. But essentially, if you look here, you can see Time Magazine saying six reasons why gamification will rule the business world. And we have four saying gamification comes of age. So even though you may not have heard gamification before, it is very much becoming a mainstream phenomenon in the business world today. And some of you, I know, for example, Robin Lowe, organizer of the event, and myself, we're both currently taking this course on Coursera on gamification. And I think it's a really interesting innovation out there. So what we have are over 70,000 students in over 150 <coughs> countries around the world are currently hooked by Kevin Verbach's course from the Warren School, University of Pennsylvania, on ga gamification. Just think about that, 70,000 students in over 150 countries. It essentially means that gamification transcends boundaries and borders. And the definition they use in the course is the application of digital game design techniques to non-game problems such as business and social impact challenges. So it's not about playing the game for the sake of the game itself. It's about using game techniques to achieve business or what we're here to talk about today, social impact challenges. Just to give you a little bit of favor, and I encourage you to go out. You have, you know, in the commercial business world, you will have Samsung Electronics using Samsung Nation, coins, badges, and leaderboards to essentially get users and customers to engage more deeply with Samsung's products. You have an American TV show called Club Sight using gamification. Nike is using it, Game On World, to get people to exercise to essentially drive more sales for Nike. And Pepsi is running Sound Off in conjunction with major music events. So gamification is big and it's hitting the commercial world. But we're here tonight to talk about social enterprises and social impact, and it is just as applicable there. For example, you have Recycle Bank, an American company. They give you little tips for how you can lead a more sustainable lifestyle, not at the macro level, but on a day-to-day -day basis, and you collect points for taking certain actions. Kiva was already mentioned earlier today. They're using leaderboards and competition elements to promote micro lending. You have companies like Fleetly and Fitocracy helping to overcome the obesity epidemic around the world by encouraging fitness. And the same thing is what health ragers are doing in healthcare. So these are just some examples, and I encourage you to go out and look more. If we are to decode gamification, what is it about? It's obviously a quite complex topic. But some of the elements that keep reoccurring are points, progress bars, leaderboards, and badges. And what's quite interesting with this points, example from Recycle Bank, users can collect points, basically, from, from various actions. LinkedIn uses a progress bar. When LinkedIn introduced the progress bar, showing how far you are towards completing your profile, across entire LinkedIn, overall profile completeness increased by 20% across the entire site by doing that very simple step. Leaderboards in the middle, you're probably familiar with it if you play computer games. It shows where you are or the team you are supporting. Then over on the right, badges are a little bit more of a modern thing, but I see a lot of you are young, so you might be four square users. And badges can be used actually in many different ways, which is interesting. It's not just a badge. You can have entry-level badges to onboard people to give them a little recognition very quickly to do something that fulfills an objective that you're trying to do. <coughs> it can also be a reward for an achievement. Someone hits a plateau or a level, they achieve something and they earn badges. They can be habit-forming. 
In this particular badge in Foursquare, if you check in at the place where you can pick up the free Metro newspaper three days in a row, you earn the badge. You're trying to create a habit. You can have event attendance. This particular one is in the US, but theoretically, conceptually, you could have been awarded one for attending TEDx KRP. And lastly, what you have are viral badges, driving social interaction, tapping into your social network, essentially. But we're not here today just to talk about gamification. We're here to talk about social impact. Our, our chosen issue that we're seeking to address is climate change, which we think is a key issue. And I'm going to give you some data. I'm a social scientist. I teach strategy sustainability in NUS Business School. If I'm lucky, I have a few decades worth of data, certainly not more than 100 years. It is a very humbling experience to come across a data set that goes back 800,000 years in time by drilling into Antarctic ice cores. So this, if we look at this, you will see over 800,000 years a near perfect correlation between global temperature, atmospheric CO2 concentration, measured as parts per million, and sea level. A near perfect, it will go up and down with the ice ages, Milankovitch cycles, those of you who, who have studied that. But the reason why we are fundamentally worried is if we push up the CO2 level, we will have higher temperature, global warming. Over time, we will see sea level. Second thing I want you to pay attention on in this graph is that over a period of 800,000 years, the atmospheric CO2 level concentration has never gone above 300. That's in an interglacial warm period where we currently are now. At the trough during an ice age, it goes down to maybe 180, 200. So never higher than 300, 800,000 years. Since the industrial evolution, revolution, we have essentially changed this quite a lot. Scientists started, the famous scientist called Keeling, end of 1950s, Mauna Loa Observatory on Hawaii, started accurately measuring the CO2 concentration for the first time. This is known as the Keeling curve, and it has been steadily rising. We're currently at 392, rising at between two to three per year way off the charts of data from 800,000 years where we never go above 300. Why is this a worry? Leading scientists like James Hansen, uh, James Hansen, the most cited climatologist in the world at NASA and Columbia University, believes and argues that when we hit somewhere between 500 and 560, we trigger irreversible disintegration of Greenland and Antarctica, which we don't know quite how fast it goes, from centuries to millennia leads to 80 meter sea level rise. So we're at 392 now, rising up to two to three per year. If we hit 500 to 560, 40 to 60 years from now essentially, we are likely to trigger irreversible integration, disintegration. You will not feel it in your lifetime, but we in this room may be the ones who kick off this pro process. Think about 80 meter sea level rise. Singapore, Jakarta, Mumbai, London, Amsterdam, Rio de Janeiro, every major city in the world is also gradual. Should you rebuild your cities every decade, every century, retreat gradually from the coastline. Major issues. I'm from Sweden, which is up there in the north. It is an unfortunate fact that those of us coming from developed countries who pump most of the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere will feel this the least. You look at North America, you look at Western Europe, Australia, Japan, will not be as severely impacted, at least not in the short run. Countries, however, in already hot tropical and subtropical countries and in low-lying coastal areas will bear the brunt of this. And unfortunately, Asia is right in the target spot for this. So it's a key issue in this part of the world. A lot of things have been written about this. I have all of these at home. I've read all of them. The problem is that the fear approach is clearly not working, which is why I'm going to come back to gamification, storytelling, and carbon story. Be worried. Be very worried, Time magazine. The truth about the coming catastrophe and our last chance to save humanity, the fight for survival as the world overheats, hell and high water, climate, weather, destruction of civilization, world on the edge, global warming's terrifying new map. The truisms contained in this are for real. I've read all of them. But obviously, the fear approach isn't working. 
Wherever we go in developed countries and we do opinion polls, we look at what people think and say, we find things like this sharp decline in the public's belief in climate threat. Australians <laughs> losing interest in environmental sustainability. Americans are profoundly bored by climate change. Climate change drops off the hot topic list. This is the reality we're facing today. And look, some of you meet us and they say, Andreas, you and your friends, you and your colleagues working on Carbon Story, it's cute what you do with gamification and storytelling. But at the end of the day, it's not going to matter. This is for governments to address. We need carbon taxes, fee and dividends, cap and trade. The international community needs to come together. We agree fully. The only problem is this. Whenever, whenever the international community comes together, we get these headlines. Copenhagen ends in failure. Durban a climate change disappointment. Cancun climate talks a failure in disguise. And most recently in June this year, the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit, failure of epic proportions. So we agree governments should act. But we are acting because we want to empower you guys to start doing something already now rather than wait. So essentially what we think it's about changing the game, and it's time for a new approach. So what Carbon Story is about, it's these words. It's to go from fear towards hope. It's about being fun, personal, empowering, making a personal impact, very emotional connection with projects around the world, being very social through Facebook and your social network, leveraging storytelling. This is when you go into Carbon Story, essentially, you have your personal account page. And, you, and I want to show you how we use gamification, because that's the purpose of the talk. You can see, for example, over on the left, this is my carbon footprint for my entire family of four people. I have, I have my wife over in the audience. 98 tons a year, of which I've offset here in this profile, 22. It's an example of a gamification progress bar. To compare people who may live alone or in large families, over on the right, we have an individualized progress bar, so it's a quarter of my family footprint. These are similar to LinkedIn gamification features to show how you're doing to give you targets to hunt. And the progress bar ticks every month. Congratulations, you lived another month. You need to come back and offset your climate damage. We're also there using badges, like, you know, for Foursquare. For example, I have a carbon neutral badge there, saying that I've been carbon neutral since December 2011. I have a 20 ton badge, having bought 20 tons. My friends in my social network have bought 100 tons. I offset for my entire house, and I bought four kinds of projects with project badges. And you also see a little bit like a control panel there, how I'm doing in terms of the project I'm sponsoring and, and my footprint. You are empowered to build your project just like Kiva. You can go around the world. I have reforestation in Bolivia, projects in Malawi, India, China, Indonesia, essentially. You can build your own project portfolio around the world. So you can come to a page, and we try to use videos and photos to create an emotional connect where you see the different projects. You can click on a particular project. Here is the Clinton Foundation. Bill Clinton's foundation working on the ground in Malawi, Africa, with sustainable agriculture, reforestation. You can learn about this project. You can see which of your friends are liking the project, buying from it, etc., etc. And you can decide to take part in this. You can also listen to videos where you see you are sponsoring projects making a tangible impact on the ground in these countries. Very important with Facebook using images. A big thing in Facebook now, you will see in, uh, Instagram and Pinterest. Having photos creating an emotional connect with people. When you like projects or you buy projects, you post it in Facebook and you can share with the world the action you're taking and what you're sponsoring. And the last bit I want to share with you today is our community element where we have leaderboards comparing yourself to your friends in your social graph, your social network, and to all users across the site, you can see also the activity flow in the bottom right corner. What's happening? Are your friends earning badges? Are they challenging others? Are they liking projects? Are they buying from projects? My parting three messages for you today is really gamification is going mainstream. Secondly, gamification can really make social enterprises more interesting and fun both or essentially for users, employees, and volunteers alike. 
And there are a lot of useful recipes out there that you can pick up if you want to go and gamify your own ventures. So party words, go forth and gamify. Think about this and think about how you can make your, your own business and social impact ventures more interesting through gamification. Thank you very much.